Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Siemens Mobility Podcast, Moving Beyond. I'm your host, Professor Sally Eves, and in today's episode, we are asking how important are innovations for a sustainable mobility? We'll be exploring the innovation that's necessary to make transportation more sustainable, the environments and the culture that encourage creative thinking, always so vital to enable the people behind the technology. And we'll reflect on the pandemic's impact on how we deal with innovation in the future too. And to do so, I'm delighted to be joined by Michael Peter, Chief Executive Officer at Siemens Mobility. Welcome, Michael. Hello there, Sally. Lovely to be speaking to you again. And also, we're being joined by Dr. Frederick Fjord, who is Chief Innovation Evangelist at Google. Welcome to you, Frederick. Hello, everyone. Excited to join you here today. And thanks, Sally, for having me today. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Very warm welcome to you too. And actually, Frederick, if I go to you first on this, I'd love to explore a little bit more around your role as Chief Innovation Evangelist at Google. And really living at Silicon Valley for a number of years now, do you still think this is the breeding ground where the most exciting innovation is thriving? That's a great question, Sally. Uh, You know, I deeply believe, and I think we now have some evidence that innovation can happen everywhere and creativity exists in all of us. You know, as an innovation evangelist, I help grow an innovation mindset with our Googlers and Stanford students, not just in Silicon Valley, but really globally with people from around the world. And I'm actually joining you today from above Silicon Valley, so to speak. And like everyone else on this planet that is now working from home or working from anywhere, so to speak, we learned in the past year that we can work from anywhere And we can also innovate from anywhere. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love something I read about you, actually, when you were saying about how you draw inspiration from kind of that view in the mountains and also just seeing your your children play, etc. as well. I love that. And I'd love to cover that a bit more later. But thank you so much for for that introduction. And Michael, now if I turn to you, so if we look at that 14-year milestone now that we have for the railway achieving that 200-year-old milestone, quite incredible. So without the steam engine, we'd have had no railway. Without railway industrialization, we wouldn't have had the shaping that we've had now for the second half of the 19th century. And it's still so critical to everyday lives today. Do you believe rail-based systems can trigger another social transformation once again through innovation? Well, I think it's it's really needed that this transformation happens. And um, rail is certainly one of the solutions possible um, I saw the statistic that by by 2050, actually another 2.5 billion people will move to cities, which is actually faster than the last 2.5 billion. It took 50 50 years for the last 2.5 billion people to move to cities. So urbanization is still accelerating. And um, you you take this and combine it with, with global warming and you ask yourself, how can you make sure that people actually can still move around at an affordable price? that everybody can move around so you can connect uh, sections of cities in a way that it's socially actually uh, becoming an attractive city and do all of this with clean transportation. And uh, one of the the very few solutions that comes to mind is rail uh, for many reasons. It has a a fantastic capacity per per space needed, but also it's very easy to make it clean because um, the most rail systems are electrical nowadays. And as long as you can feed clean energy into the system, you have 100% sustainable system there. So I think uh, it'll play an extremely vital role in, in how we uh, we will develop uh, planet Earth and uh, how we will maintain our standard of living in the next uh, years to come. Absolutely. I think a great point there around safety as well. I think that's been obviously front of mind to so many, I think can really, really lead the way there. And also obviously around connected mobility as well. So perhaps now if we have a look around innovation in the field of transport that's most closest to you. So I'd love to hear some examples either related to your role or outside activities about what has impressed you the most in transportation innovation. And outside of that too, maybe what do you think should have been introduced and maybe should have been available a long time ago? That's an interesting question. Um, So what probably impressed me personally the most in the field of transportation are actually ships, or more precisely, sailboats, because they are powered by actually two things, nature, so wind, a renewable energy source, and the crew's courage, that explorer mindset of the captain and the crew. 
So everyone on a on board shows that explorer mindset and needs to trust each other navigating the open sea. And sailing, you know, this ultimate freedom, the experience of being at one with nature. So this form of transportation and the mindset you need similar to an innovator impresses me really. And that's why we spend a lot of time on our sailboat too. And I want to continue to grow these mindsets, uh, you know, with my children and my family, friends and, and others. This, re this really this mindset of an explorer. So actually, when you ask me what impresses me most in innovation, I wouldn't think of transportation firstly. I would probably think of telecommunications. If I think about this little thing, voice over IP, how it has changed the world. And the, the telephone today, you can also speak, but uh, really it does six million other things. And I ask myself every day, how can we bring this innovation spirit into, into the railway world? And um, so that's, that's more the angle that I take there. And kind of drawing on from that, I'm um, looking at sustainable means of transport. What's your take on locally emission-free railway? Um, do you think that is a sustainable means per se, or do you think we need more innovation around the development of sustainable mobility? I think railways in itself are extremely sustainable. Um, the uh, a rail vehicle uses roughly 500 kilograms of material per passenger, so it's a lot less than a car. And the lifetime mileage you get out of a rail vehicle is about 200,000 kilometers a year, which is the, uh, and that for, for 40 years. So basically per year you, you get out of a rail vehicle, what you get out of a car in a, in a lifetime. So you use probably 40, 50, 80 times less material to move a person. So, so the question of how much resources can Mother Earth provide and, and can we afford to live like we live? Is, is easily answered when it comes to transportation. I mean, rail is, is so much more, more efficient there. So reflecting on milestones, I mentioned earlier around the 200-year milestone. Do you think, and maybe Frederick, a question for you, that innovations have a particularly hard time when they question elements of a system that's been so well established and proven over time? Yeah, so uh, Google just turned 22 years, uh, so we are far away from uh, 200 years um, um, milestone. Um, and we have seen that everywhere innovation has a hard time in the beginning because it usually means change and people usually don't like change. <clears throat> so how do you react to a new idea? That's the question uh, I usually ask people in organizations. <clears throat> and it's fascinating that most of the time you actually hear uh, what's called a negativity bias that is built into our brains. It's basically a bias that helped us to survive in the past. It's when you hear a new idea or something is changing, you usually react uh, in a way that points out the mistakes or the flaws first. So I can give you an example on how that actually shows up. If you want to close your eyes for a moment, trust me here for a second. Fantastic. Doing that now. One plus two equals three. Two plus four equals six. Four plus four equals nine. Three plus two equals five. You can open your eyes again. And so what happened is that most of us have this immediate reaction when I share the third equation that is wrong. Four plus four doesn't equal nine, it equals eight. And so people immediately stick to that third equation instead of focusing on the three other ones, saying like, huh, interesting, 75% 75, 75 of those equations were actually correct. So great job. It is really built into our uh, brains, that negativity bias. And so what I would say is that you know, we need to focus on the positives. We need to develop that optimistic mindset to really see a chance in a new idea, an opportunity to do actually something better. And so for me, that really comes in that quote of uh, Seneca. Most of progress consists in the desire to make progress. So you have to have that mindset that you want to move into the future, that you want to move forward. And so optimism really helps with that. And so I personally can't wait to live in the future. Can you? 
I love that example. Maybe twisting that slightly, you were talking very much about that, in, you know, inbuilt resistance to change to a certain extent. Turning that around to a question for Michael about not resistance to change, but maybe immunity to innovation. What do you think about the railway industry as an example of that? Is the concept too good? Is that why some of the issues we've talked about are the way they are? What, what's your thoughts on that, Michael? Well, it's not too hard. I mean, if you think about railways, it all started with a fantastic innovation, like you rightfully said. Um, I think one of the very first applications to convert electricity into movement and vice versa was the generator and then the electric motor, which actually was uh, directly applied to to um, electric locomotives. The, the issue is, and I think you, you mentioned that, if you have a huge system uh, like we have today in national railways and you want to innovate within that system, then it becomes very, very difficult because everything you touch has interfaces and uh, you have a lot of this negativity that Frederick just mentioned. Oh, if I do this, what what do I break? So I think one of the, of the answers is really to take people out of their normal um, space where they are and out of the, the constraints and let them think freely. And the challenge is, of course, that at the end of the day, you have to bring it back to the rail world, uh, railway world if, if you want it to work. There is uh, fantastic innovations out here. And I must say, maybe we're two generations late. But this idea that I mentioned with the telephone to actually go when you control a railway network, not anymore by by analog technology, but make it actually also over IP so you can control all elements in the field everywhere. Basically just applying industry standards like IoT networks and then make it more abstract and use artificial intelligence to optimize networks and how you run trains um, will uh, have a huge impact on, on, on your networks and a huge benefit. That, and that's a nice thing once you, you crack that nut in the, in the railway industry. The benefit is real and is, is comparably large versus many other applications. So if you can, if you can run on the same network 30 40% more trains, just imagine the, the huge cost of building additional rails, uh, of, of drilling more tunnels, building more bridges to increase capacity. I mean, you're, you're talking about 30 years of construction and uh, tens of billions of, of dollars or euros that, that you would have to spend for for single railway line today. And, and to being able to be able to, to actually get that type of increase of efficiency in an existing system just by uh, applying new new thinking about the system is is of course a huge reward and a, and, and a huge uh, motivation um, to, to making these these improvements. Absolutely, absolutely. And the ripple of effect of that innovation across the ecosystem as well, I think, is something um, to, to bring to bear as well. And maybe we should pause for thought here, actually. We're talking about innovation so much literally throughout our conversation today, but we haven't kind of paused to reflect on what we actually mean by that. And Frederick, I think you're the absolute ideal person to, to come in on this about how we should really define innovation. Yeah, thanks, Sally. Um, so to be honest, I don't think it's uh, very helpful to our listeners to go in depth into defining what an innovation is, <clears throat> rather sharing how to develop an innovation. And I found that mindset really matters most. And for me, an innovator's mindset consists of three things, empathy, expansive thinking, and experimentation. And all of that fueled by optimism that I talked about. So practicing those mindsets will help you grow as an innovator to then hopefully develop the next big thing. So we see experimentation happening everywhere currently. We see how we work from anywhere in experimenting in that field. We see that we shop in a very different way currently, mostly online. And also we see, you know, experiments that are probably bigger when you look at SpaceX and how they are currently experimenting, you know, launching and landing rockets and also putting men in space. So it's really interesting that we see that experimentation mindset happening truly everywhere at the moment. But for me, it's not about what an innovation is. It's really how to develop an innovation mindset. Excellent, excellent. Some great examples there. And perhaps we can draw on this a little bit more to look at the environments that help cultivate this. 
Um, so we maybe can talk about leadership and failure culture, but really how we're encouraging creative thinking, what that really means. So perhaps um, first to, to you, Frederick, on this, what would you say? I know you started kind of um, setting this up already, but creating an innovation environment, encouraging creative thinking, what does that involve? How can organisations support that? Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting question that we actually explored uh, at Google uh, over the past years too. So we were exploring that question, what makes a great team? And so we um, conducted some research over two years and interviewed about 200 uh, Googlers, our employees, and looked at over 250 attributes of uh, roughly 180 active teams at Google. And what we found was very interesting, that it really comes down to one ingredient that makes a successful innovative team, and that is psychological safety. So that question on how we can take risks on teams without feeling insecure or embarrassed. For us, there's no team or a good team without trust. And that psychological safety is a sense of confidence that the team will not embarrass, reject, or punish someone for speaking up. So it's also related to inclusion and diversity, having different ideas on the team coming from different people and being inclusive as a team so that you give everybody a voice really makes psychological safety um, one of the, the main ingredients for successful and innovative teams. Yeah, it um, aligns hugely with my, my experience and our experience, but I never thought about it as psychological safety, to be honest. That's a very interesting interesting point uh, that you're making there, Frederick. I mean, for, we, for us, it was always obvious we have to take people out of the daily environment so that they can be free to innovate. And again, this has to do with this huge safety culture that we have. I mean, to give you a couple of examples for infrastructure when you control signals you have to prove that you have one mistake in one in a thousand years when you have projects billion worth three billion euros and you have to deliver a train after three years exactly on the day otherwise you have liquidated damages of twenty thousand euros a day you don't exactly um, motivate a failure culture and when you keep people in this environment the innovation that happens is pretty much zero and the other one was always well if you only take people that have done what i just said for for the last 20 years there's no innovation so you, you have to mix up the teams and and that's one of the big challenges in our industry to become more diverse now we're attracting a lot of uh, young young people from all over the world um, and we find actually they don't join us so much for technology and safety thinking. They join us because of the mission of how can we move people around and, and enjoy moving people around in an um, environmental-friendly way. And then it comes back again to um, how do I mix this up with people who have the domain know-how and who have the experience um, and, and, and that the idea of bringing them together in a way that they actually feel safe to contribute without being shut down by each other because they are so 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 different is, is a huge part of the the big innovations that um, we have have been successful with in the past. I love what you said there, by the way, about reasons for people joining an organization and what you were saying pretty much around purpose. There was something that literally was released about a week ago saying about 70% of people were saying their identity was so tied to, to their role and that kind of that hybridity of, of values having to be the same across per professional and personal life. Some really interesting elements there. And perhaps Frederick, go back over to you on this. And I know you've written about this extensively, but I'd love if you could dive into deep about how we can learn from failure. I think learning culture is such an interesting topic. But if we started from that point, I think that'd be really interesting. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so first, I think we need to remove this notion, learning from failure, right? And just uh, erase failure, because no one likes to fail, but probably focus more on the learning, because People usually like to learn. And one of the best ways for an innovator or truly for everyone to learn is through experimentation. So scientists, designers, and actually babies and children have something in common. They all learn through experiments, trying things. But if you look at an organization, the question that fascinating, 
fascinates me more is how can you encourage risk taking in an organization? And this is really where we can learn from nature again. So a while back, I was actually um, on a ship called the Entrepreneurship, sailing uh, literally at the end of the world with students from Stanford and from Chile, uh, teaching them on entrepreneurship and uh, prototyping and experimentation. And we found some penguins. And so we observed those penguins. And what's, what's fascinating is that when you look at penguins, when they're standing on an ice shelf, there's always one penguin that jumps first into the water. It's the courageous penguin. And all the other penguins are watching very closely to observe if that penguin comes up back again out of the water, maybe they found some fish or they have been eaten. And so what tells us that example is that there has to be one person that jumps into the cold water first. That's the courageous penguins in your organization. And rewarding them for actually taking that risk is very important because if no one jumps from that ice shelf, everyone dies. So really kind of like what we um, try to do at Google, for example, is I introduced the Penguin Award in a team to really recognize the people who were jumping first, trying something different and starting to learn. And so the Penguin Award was really giving that recognition to people which they needed because that signals that it's okay to take a risk because you want to learn and you want to help others to also learn too. Michael, back to you. How would you describe learning culture at Siemens? What, what are you seeing there? You know, how is the leadership supporting creative thinking and innovation? You know, reward the behavior you want to see and make it fun. Um, when I said earlier on that... Um, Scale brings you 5% efficiency maybe in, in our industry, but uh, di digitalization technology can bring you 30% job. I think the other part is motivation of your employees probably brings you 40% because I know for myself when, when I don't feel good, I, I'm maybe 60% efficient and that's far away from 100 or 110. I think I'm um, actually looking for a culture where you, where you have small successes and when it's a failure, you rather create a culture where you can laugh about it and move on. I think this is much more effective to, to also um, achieve long-time uh, engagement of the people and have them come to work in the morning and think, I want to change the world. I want to create something better than what we have today and have this um, purpose that you said, keep alive and keep driving our, our organization and, and, and hence then also produce the innovation and the, and the progress that we, that we want to see. And, and this is the type of environment we want to create and um, this, this is the type of culture we want to have at Siemens Mobility that when people join, um, they have fun. At the end of the day, we, we come to work to do something something good and, 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 and feel good about it. And I think this is one of the key ingredients if, um, if we want to innovate. It's that spirit of innovation is coming across really strongly here, isn't it? And you know, celebrating for people trying and daring to do something new. And perhaps before we move on to, to another area, um, I'd love to, to mention this to, to Frederick about creativity. I'd love you to share your take on this about credit, creativity is something that can be learned or something is a matter of type. I think it's, it's an interesting that we're all born creative, but what we are lacking is creative confidence, that confidence to actually turn our ideas into reality and act on those ideas with courage. So for me, it's really that uh, it's interesting as well that you can unlearn to be creative in a way that you lose your confidence in your creativity, right? And that is shown by actually, if you look at children and how many questions they ask per day, it's about 140 questions or even more. And us as adults, we probably, the courageous ones amongst us, ask about four questions per day. And even those questions um, are not truly kind of like, you know, imaginary that really help us to put a vision of the future out there. It's usually safe questions we ask. So I want to encourage more and more people to really tap into their creativity and their confidence to act on those ideas. 
you are asking a really tough question. Um, are you born creative or can you, can you train creativity in a single person? But, but when you bring it back to the idea of a team, it's very easy. You, a team can be made creative much more easily. And I think it will automatically inspire every single person in the team to be more creative. And I think this for a company like Siemens is probably the much easier question to resolve with a much bigger outcome. And uh, hence, I would focus in my, my professional life. I would rather focus on that. And Michael, you, you just uh, uh, inspired a, a thought as well. And that is around how you can support creative thinking and uh, support an innovation process in a team, right? I, th I think, first of all, uh, giving that team permission to experiment and therefore to learn, right? And we all, we humans look for that permission, you know, from our friends, from our, you know, parents, from, from uh, our managers, from our leaders and so forth. And we really have that power to give permission to each other to say like, yeah, let's, let's try something different. Let's try something new. And then the second one that uh, was just inspired by, by your sharing, uh, Michael, is that for me, the best leaders really lead with questions, not answers. Those what if questions that really open up that possibility space. For example, what if we can launch a rocket and land it safely on the planet again to refuel it in 24 hours to make space travel more affordable and available to people, right? That's what we're currently seeing SpaceX is exploring. Or Google once asked the question 22 years ago at Stanford University uh, by Larry Page and Sergey Brin, what if we can download the internet, and make all information accessible and available to people around the world whenever they need it, wherever they are? Or another question I find fascinating uh, is from Waymo, one of our uh, former Google X um, uh, initiatives uh, on uh, autonomous driving. They ask, what if you could build the world's most experienced driver? That's what they're currently exploring. Or um, what if we don't produce any waste anymore, right? Um, or what if we can turn all our old plastic into anything, right? So you can continue to ask those questions. And I think that really sparks some imagination within teams, within organizations. But leading with that question, I think is very important if you want to build an innovation culture as well. Absolutely. And I think maybe a couple of other things just springing to mind as you're talking there about um, the diversity of experience that's making up the team um, to support creativity as well. And, and maybe things around, you know, I'm, I'm a big advocate of STEAM learning, but having that kind of um, um, confidence in creativity. And I think sometimes at school, certain subjects have been less prioritised. Um, so I think we need to embrace the, the arts alongside the technology as well. So I think the STEAM focus is an interesting area to explore as well. So really, really interesting take there. And we were talking about imagination and uh, maybe if we explore the pandemic for a second and about the impact that's had on innovation uh, in many ways, I think it's helped everyone pause for thought, almost like a three R effect. So, you know, to reflect and maybe to reframe and reimagine what the future looks like. So if we maybe explore pandemic in innovation impact, what are you finding there? Michael, did you want to come in on that? I think there's small learnings and big learnings. Um, and one of the big ones when I related transportation is, We've learned now all of a sudden from one second to the next that maybe we don't have to be all at the exact time in the office, that maybe we don't really need a rush hour in our cities that clocks up everything and makes the whole system so incredibly inefficient. Um, if we can take this this new one liberty uh, into, into the after corona times, it opens up a whole ocean of possibilities for transportation systems. And um, my favorite example is that most metro systems in the world are only 20% loaded than average. They're completely overcrowded in peak hours. And then they run empty for the rest of the day. And um, most of you also know that metro systems are subsidized in almost every city in the world, usually by 50%, which means if we could just have every train 40% occupied on average, it would be a profitable system. And, and if I think now what that means for transportation, how you could build a system in a city, how how much you could expand it to make it much more convenient. And 40% still means that everybody would have a seat available and you would even probably have a seat next to you free. 
and, and it still would be profitable all of a sudden. And, and all of this just because people don't have this eight to five routine, but they maybe in the morning check the, the calendar and they say, these are the two hours. I really want to meet people and have meetings and it's more efficient for me to, to do the rest from, from home. And then, then they look, um, look up a connection that works for them where they have a seat available in, in the train, in the, even in the metro train or the light rail train. You, you would come to a completely different design of a city all of a sudden. I mean, you would free up so much so much space in the city to walk around, to have uh, play yards, to have coffee places or, or coffee shops to, to enjoy your time. Michael, I can fully support uh, what you just shared, that we all had like small and big learnings, right? And I think just reflecting about those learnings that we are generating, right, over the um, past few, you know, weeks, months, or even years is just, just fascinating. Uh, and see that that learning has accelerated as well, right? We're learning quite a big amount in a very short amount of time. For me, really looking at the pandemic in the last year, um, it really, I feel it, un it unleashed the best and the worst in humanity. I think, you know, we are all showing more empathy. If we're looking at the workplace, for example, we literally can see each other now, right? See, you know, not just our backgrounds, but how are people living, right? How are uh, people thinking and feeling every day? And I think that empathy is really something uh, very powerful that we see that has been unleashed, but also more experimentation. For me, it's interesting that everyone overnight had to reimagine how we live, work, play, and learn. And how we spend our time, as you said, Michael, as well. And to reimagine is a good thing. I feel we don't do it often enough to really pause and then think about like, how do we want to spend our time? What's most valuable? How can I contribute to, you know, uh, my organization, but also the world? But also, I think looking at the pandemic, maybe it's uh, good to answer it with a, a, a metaphor, uh, again, a, a metaphor of a ship that I used earlier, right? We can all see ourselves as maybe ships, right? Individuals as smaller ships, you know, startups as somewhat larger, medium-sized as, you know, large companies or governments as those tankers. Uh, and we all moved around the safe harbor before the pandemic. You know, the lines were tightened, right? Everything was safe most of the time. There has always been, you know, a wind blowing through the harbors. But if it has never been the case that suddenly all the lines were cut loose. And so we got into this situation with a pandemic, right? The lines were cut loose. All boats are floating now on the sea. And now it becomes very apparent and very clear which boats are seaworthy at all, which have moved out of the port in the past. Perhaps now it also shows how the crews were prepared. And the captain, what was the mindset of the crew members? How did they react when they had to navigate the sea in strong winds? Do you want to go straight back to the port? Or do you say, we're going out into the fog and trying to reach another port, maybe a new port? And that's what makes this time so exciting for me, because a lot can arise and there's many opportunities. And Sally, you mentioned something interesting that is reframing, right? Turning problems into possibilities. And that is something we can train ourselves in. When we look at problems, we can, you know, um, turn them into an opportunity by asking a question related to that problem. And for me, that reframing is something we can, again, train ourselves in so that we can hopefully look at problems as possibilities in the future as well. I love everything you were describing there with the everyone's a ship metaphor. Just a very quick follow on. Um, you were talking about some of the new innovation work you're doing at Google and you're just thinking about giving that time and that space to be able to invest in this. Is the 80-20 rule that's talked about a lot at Google, does that still apply? Uh, absolutely. I'm applying it right now, uh, I guess, uh, because I use my 20% time to help, <laughs> you know, hopefully everyone uh, today and in the future to grow an innovation mindset. And it helps me to, to learn something new, uh, every day. Interpreted as a chance to follow personal passions during our spare time. 
And I think that's okay as a way to keep people engaged. But there's actually another side to encouraging 20% initiatives. Telling employees to follow their insight is a formal acknowledgement that the people you've hired just might be smarter or more creative than you and allowing space for that. Because again, the worst or the best thing that can happen is in someone's 20% time, they learn something new. Yeah, for Siemens, first of all, we really appreciate the team that we work in and the spirit. Um, I think we really appreciate our purpose that, that, that you talked about. Um, it uh, manifests itself also that we're missing each other quite a bit. I mean, we are people that live in project worlds and that uh, usually create together and uh, to doing it in a different way now, it works, but there's also a lot missing. For us, um, we um, have also seen the advantages of not having to be at a certain place all day long. It's not necessarily good for creativity or productivity. We have not seen productivity drop down, even though we went from one moment to the next to 100% home office. It's going to be better for productivity, but definitely be better for inclusion, for diversity, for allowing more people to join our company um, that cannot move every uh, three years to a different city and, and live as close as possible to, to wherever we decide our offices are. Thank you for sharing that, Michael. I think at this juncture, I'm going to go to a question from the influencer community. So this is from Neil Catamol, who's director at The Future as a Service. Hi, Sally. I would like to ask the panel the following question. With many organisations moving to a hybrid workplace model beyond the pandemic, collaboration and connectivity is key. How do we also ensure people feel connected, engaged and not isolated? That's a great question, Neil. Um, I think even before the pandemic, right, uh, collaboration, you know, mattered uh, and it still matters. We all as humanity have to work together and collaborate to really come up with better solutions to the biggest problems in our um, world. I think we need to create a new sense of belonging. And this is an exciting question to ask. How do you create a sense of belonging and connectedness in this new world? I think through rituals, these powerful routines with intention that help us feel more human, even in a digital first environment. Because really for centuries, humans have understood that small, tangible acts done routinely can carry value and meaning. And so these rituals can help build the muscle memory of an organizational culture. And the power of rituals can be used in organizations to really engender a sense of community, create togetherness in times of distance and build cohesion and ultimately help to take an organization from good to great. So I encourage you to start experimenting with new rituals that really help to build that collaboration muscle and connectivity in this digital first environment. Yeah, I want to just share a, uh, an example actually from today um, that Sally and Michael and myself practice in terms of a ritual and how we can, you know, feel more connected and more engaged and not so isolated, even in a digital first world. Uh, so we used a ritual preparing for this podcast that we just asked ourselves a question and we shared what brought us joy today? And so that really helped us to create a fast track to feel connected and engaged. So Neil, again, coming back to your question, I think maybe starting your team meetings with a ritual like that, where you ask a question to your team members and everybody has a chance to share, might create this sense of belonging moving forward. Absolutely. It's almost that reflection that we were talking about earlier on, isn't it, about what we value in, in many cases, having that pause for thought to think about that in a bit more detail. And maybe on, on Neil's point about isolation as well, looking at that maybe with alternative means like technology as an example, something that came out, some new research was showing that employees felt more comfortable talking to like an AI, conversational AI chatbot than the manager about their mental health. So maybe exploring those areas as well about how tech can be a conduit to address those kind of challenges too. So, so much to unpack on that one. I think it could be another discussion there. Absolutely. Thank you both. And I know we're, we're kind of getting short for, for time here now. So maybe we have one final wrap-up question. Um, and we're going to go very optimistic. So if we have one wish, 
what innovation would you really like to see for yourself or for humanity more generally? So maybe to um, Michael first on that one. I think what I would like to see is truly demand responsive, end-to-end seamless transportation for everyone and clean. I think it would make a huge difference in our lives. It would save us time. It would get us quality back. The one question I ask myself many times is if I could build a new city or take an existing city, how would I dedicate the space to to which activities? And um, I'm I'm a big city person. I I like cities like San Francisco, Madrid, Berlin. And uh, I like them because I can walk around and I see people doing things and I see people socializing. Socializing, I see it as an opportunity to meet people or to also see some crazy things going on or people doing things that I didn't expect to happen. This freedom that comes with being in a big place also um, because you don't, uh, you're not expected to be exactly within the norm 100%. And um, <clears throat> I think. I think uh, how to dedicate the space in the city has a lot to do with it. That's maybe the one thing I would uh, I would like to see resolved. I would like to see is that everyone starts to innovate, small or big. The future is not out there somewhere on the horizon. It's in our minds and the minds around us. So we have to bring these ideas out of our minds into the reality. And I think that would help make humanity leap forward. Absolutely agree. And I, I would kind of say underpinning that as well, democratization of access to education, you know, to give that the, that holistic skill set, but also the skills confidence to apply them as well. What some some great conversations there. Um, so to bring everything to a close, I just want to say thank you to you both for a fantastic conversation today, right across different realms of innovation and creativity in transport, but also beyond that as well, both in organisations, but individually and across our teams too. So thank you very much to Michael and Frederick. Um, and I'm closing out now our episode of Moving Beyond. And I hope everybody's enjoyed the, the conversation. And we're also going to be sharing some follow up um, materials as well so we can keep that conversation going and follow up with questions. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. And hopefully see you beyond. Thank you.